Hi, and welcome back to Rock the JVM's Scala at Lightspeed. I'm Daniel, and in this video, we will discuss functional programming in Scala. Now, I'm going to get back to our project that we started in an earlier video, and I'm going to continue with a dedicated application specifically for this video. So I will assume that you've watched the rest of the series so far. If you haven't, go back and watch that because we discussed the fundamentals that we are going to use in this video. So I'm going to click on rock.com.rock.jvm and I'm going to create a new Scala application. So right click new, Scala class, I'm going to name this functional programming. And I'm going to make it an object as before, and I'm going to make it extend app. So extends app. In the previous video where we discussed object orientation, you understood what an object is and what extends app meant. Now, before we discuss functional programming, it's worth recapping some very important points that I will be using when proving some functional programming principles here in Scala. So we know that Scala is an object oriented language. In the sense that we can define a class, let's call this person, for example, and the person class can have some constructor arguments. For example, the person can have a name as a string. And Scala has this very nice apply special method. So if you define an apply method to a class, let's have, for example, an age as an int, and this prints line, I have aged age years. All right, so if I define an apply method that looks something like this, an apply method that takes some constructor arguments, and if I create an instance of this class, let's say I create an instance called Bob as new person with the name Bob, I can call bob.apply with the age 43, or I can simply say Bob applied to 43. So I'm basically invoking Bob as a function. This actually signals to the compiler that I'm actually going calling the apply method. So this is equal to bob.apply with the argument 43. So the presence of an apply method allows an instance of a class to be invoked like a function. Now this is important. Why is that? Scala runs on the JVM. So the Java Virtual Machine is the infrastructure on which all Java programs run. And there are many languages that compile to Java Virtual Machine bytecode, like Scala, but the JVM was fundamentally built for Java, which is the prototypical object-oriented language. And so the JVM knows what an object is, but it doesn't know what a function is as a first-class citizen. What do we mean by that? In functional programming, We want to work with functions as what we call first class elements of programming. What do we mean by that? We want to be able to work with functions like we work with any other kind of values. So we want to compose functions, pass functions as arguments, and return functions as results. The kind of stuff that we normally operate on when we work with objects or plain values. So we want to do that with functions as well. So. Because the JVM was not fundamentally built for functional programming, it was built for object-oriented programming, how do we implement functional programming on the JVM? And the result was that the Scala people invented some very, very interesting and very clever traits called function X. Let me give you an example. Let me define a small function that I'm going to call simple incrementer. As a new, and here's what I'm going to write. I'm going to write function one typed with int and int. That is a function that takes an int and returns an int. This is just a plain trait with an apply method. So if I create an apply that takes the argument as an int and returns the argument plus one, I have defined an instance of this function one trait. And then I can call simple incrementer dot apply with the argument let's say 23 and I would return 24 right because simple incrementer dot apply takes 23 and returns 23 plus 1 but I can simply call simple incrementer on 23 and this is the same as calling the apply method so what have we done here we have instantiated this trait 
that we called function one, but ignore the name for now. The function one name is not important. We've just instantiated a trait. Now, this object that we have created can be invoked like a function because it has an apply method. And the only thing that it supports is to be invoked like a function. So we've basically defined a function. Because it acts like a function and the only thing that it can do is act like a function. It takes a bunch of arguments and it returns something else. So the conclusion that I want you to take away from this video is that all Scala functions are instances of these function x type. So the way that we've implemented a functional language on top of the JVM, which is fundamentally built for object orientation, is to make functions actually instances of this function one, function two, function three, and so on and so forth traits. So this function x means function one, function two, all the way to function 22. So 22 is the maximum number of arguments that you can pass to a function. And all the Scala functions that we define are actually instances of this function x trait. Just as another example, if I define a string concatenator as a function that takes two strings and returns another string, we can define a function 2, which takes two type arguments, string, string, and the third type argument is the return type, which is string. And the apply method takes arg1 as a string and arg2 as a string and returns, for example, arg1 plus arg2. In much the same way, we can simply apply this function, this string concatenator, on multiple strings. So for example, I can call string concatenator to let's say I love and then the string Scala. And this will return the string I love Scala. So this is an example of a function with two arguments and a string return type. Good, now I'm gonna show you some bits and pieces here about Scala as a functional programming language. First of all, I'm gonna show you some syntax sugars. Syntax sugars means alternative syntax that will replace these much heavier boilerplate code. So I can create, for example, let's call this doubler as a function one from int to int as, watch what I'm writing, x colon int arrow, and then I'm going to say two times x. So this is a function that takes an argument of type int and returns twice that. And obviously I can call doubler on say the number four and I would get eight, of course. So what I've done here with this very shorthand notation is I've basically defined a new function one with int and int in which the apply method, so override def apply, takes an argument x as an int and returns two times that argument. So this shorthand notation is the equivalent of this much longer notation, which for large code bases is extremely hard to read. So this is equivalent to the much longer this guy. All right, so I hope this makes sense. Another syntax sugar is related to the actual function type. So function one typed with int and int is noted in Scala as int arrow int. So int arrow int is equivalent to function one of int and int. So this is equivalent to the much longer val doubler of type function one of int and int equals new function int int and so on and so forth. In fact, you can go as far as omit the type altogether because the compiler is smart enough to infer that for you. So notice what happens if I cut this out, the compiler is still happy with my code. And if I hover over this value, it notice int arrow int. This is automatically inferred by the compiler. But I'm gonna put this here for your future reference when you look at the code again. Now, I mentioned before that the goal of functional programming is to be able to compose functions, pass functions along, 
eventually pass functions as arguments or return functions as results. Now, the methods or functions that take functions as arguments or return functions as results are called higher order functions. So higher order functions either take functions as arguments or return functions as results or both. Let me give you some examples. So if I create a mapped list from list one to three dot map map is a very special method on the list type in that it allows the passing of a function. So notice the map expects a function from int to some other type. So I can put x arrow x plus one. I don't even need to mention the type of x because the compiler automatically infers that x is an int because the list of one, two, three is a list of ints. And this anonymous function that I've created, which is the equivalent of new function one with int and int and so on and so forth, this anonymous function is passed as argument to the map method. And so the map method on the list type is called a higher order function. Now, the return value of list123 map with this anonymous function is another list. So if I go ahead and print line a mapped list and I run this application, you will notice that this function is applied to every single element 1, 2, 3, and we obtain 2, 3, 4 in another list. And so the return type is a list of int. Now, as I mentioned before in the object-oriented video earlier, the application of a method on a list or on any object that is due to modify the original object will actually return another instance. And so a mapped list that we have to obtain here is a very different list than the list one, two, three on which I originally applied the map method. Another classical higher order function is called flat map. Let me give you an example, a flat mapped list as let's say list one, two, three dot flat map. And the flat map function takes as argument a function from int to another collection of a given type. So let me give you an example. Let's say that for every single element x that belongs to this list, so x is one, two, three in turn. And for every element, I will return another list. Let's say x and two times x. So for every element in this list, for every element in the list one, two, three, applying this function will return another list. So I will obtain the lists one, two, the list two, four, and the list three, six. Now flat map's job is to concatenate all these small lists into another big list. So if I print line a flat map list, we will obtain the lists one, two, two, four, and three, six concatenated into a single list. So notice here the list one, two, two, four, three, six, all in a single list. Flat map is used very, very often in practice. Now, as you write some Scala code and as you look at other people's code, you might notice the following quirky syntax. Instead of passing this lambda as it is inside some parentheses, you might be seeing this alternative syntax where you say list one, two, three dot flat map and somebody opens a curly brace and on another line they pass in the lambda. And it's usually in the form of x arrow and then on another line the returned value. This is alternative syntax. And this is the same as dot map with x arrow list with x and two times x inside the regular parentheses that you've probably been used to from the other programming languages. Now, another classical higher order function that we normally use on collections is filtered. So a filtered list as let's say list one, two, three, four, five. And let's say we want to filter out just the elements smaller than three. So filter, filter takes a function from int to Boolean and the return value, the return list will contain just those values for which the predicate returns true. So I will say that for every X that is returned in the result, X must be less than or equal to three. So 
x less than or equal to 3 is an expression that returns a boolean. x arrow x less than or equal to 3 is an anonymous function. Filter takes this anonymous function and returns a new list containing only those elements from the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for which this expression returns true. So this will contain just the list 1, 2, 3. So if I print line a filtered list, I should be seeing the list 1, 2, 3, which is what you see here in the console. Now, I'm going to show you some alternative, even shorter syntax. If this wasn't short enough, Scala allows even shorter syntax. And I will be writing as follows. I'm going to say underscore less than or equal to 3. Underscore less than or equal to 3 is equivalent to x arrow x less than or equal to 3. The Scala people that wrote the Scala syntax probably thought that repeating x twice was too much typing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in Scala we usually work with immutable objects and immutable collections in this case. So every single application to map, flat map, or filter will always return another instance of a list. And so because every single call to map, flat map, and filter returns another instance, we can chain applications to map, flat map, and filter. Let me give you an example. Let's say we want to create all the pairs between the numbers 1, 2, 3, and the letters A, B, and C. So we want all the combinations 1A, 1B, 1C, 2A, 2B, 2C, and 3A, 3B, 3C. We want all the possible combinations. A way to do that in Scala is to map and flat map the lists 1, 2, 3 and the lists A, B, C. And here's how we could do that. So let's create all pairs as the list 1, 2, 3 dot flat map. All right, so I'm going to call flat map on the list 1, 2, 3. And for every single element 1, 2, 3, I will return another small list. For example, if I take the element 1, I should return the smallest 1a, 1b, and 1c. So I will need to run a map on the list abc. This is a lot to handle in your head. So I'm going to write some code and hopefully it will make sense as I write it. So for every single element belonging to this numbers list, I'm actually going to call this number just to be a little bit more explicit. So for every number, I will run the list A, B, and C. Let me collapse my menu so that you can see my code a little bit more clearly. So for every number, I'm going to take the list A, B, C, and I'm going to prepend this number to every single letter. So I'm going to call map. And for every letter, I'm going to return the string composing of the number. So I'm going to inject that in an S interpolated string. So I'm going to say S quote. And with a dollar sign, I'm going to inject the number. Let me say I'm going to put a dash here. And I'm going to also add the letter. All right. So I'm going to say 1A, 1B, and 1C for every single number in the original list. And that will be the same for the list number 2 and for, this, for the list number 3. And because I'm calling flat map, all these small lists will be concatenated into one big list. So if I print line all pairs, you should be pleased of what you're going to see in the console. So we have the list 1a, 1b, 1c, 2a, 2b, 2c, and 3a, 3b, 3c. So notice how we can quote unquote iterate through collections without using for loops, without using any kind of looping or iteration. We're just calling maps, flat maps, and maybe filtering if we want to pass in some conditions on those numbers. So again, I'm calling flat map on the original list such that for every number I'm returning another small list. And that small list is obtained by this expression in which for every single letter containing in the list ABC, I am prepending that number to that letter. So I hope that makes, that makes sense. Now, in big Scala code bases, chains such as this one are increasingly hard to read if the logic is increasingly complex. And so the Scala syntax allows for a pretty human readable chains of maps and flat maps and filters in what we call four comprehensions. 
So let me give you an example, an equivalent example to the one that I just wrote. Let's call this alternative pairs as being four. So four is a keyword in SCA, but that does not mean four loops. This is a four comprehension and the four comprehension is an expression that we are going to attribute to this value. So watch what I'm writing here. I'm going to say for number left arrow, left thin arrow. So look at this error in list one, two, three. On another row, I'm going to say letter in the list A, B and C. I'm going to say yield the string at the S interpolated string number dash letter. This for expression over here is a single expression that can be reduced to a value. In this case, the list 1a, 1b, 1c, 2a, 2b, 2c, and 3a, 3b, 3c. This is equivalent to the map flat map chain above. So whenever the compiler sees a for comprehension, it will actually deconstruct that into a chain of flat maps and maps in much the same way as I wrote above. In fact, these two expressions are identical to the compiler. This kind of chaining of maps, flat maps, filtering, and for comprehensions will prove particularly useful in whatever collections you might have to deal with. And you'll probably deal with a lot of collections. If you're working in a parallel or distributed environment, if you're working with Spark data frames or with resilient distributed data sets or whatever kind of linear, multidimensional, parallel distributed collections you might work with, this kind of mapping, flat mapping, filtering, and for comprehension skills will prove useful there. Speaking of collections, let me show you a couple of collections. So first, I'm going to show you lists. They are the fundamental collection of uh, functional programming. So I'm going to define a list as, let's say, list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The map flat map filter will work for all the collections that I'm going to list, so I'm not going to mention them every single time. The list has the property that it has a head and a tail. The head is the first element of the list, the tail is the remainder of the list. So I'm going to call this first element as a list.head and val rest as a list.tail. So head and tail are the fundamental operations on list. Lists can be prepended and appended with elements. So I'm going to say a prepended list as, let's say, zero prepended to a list. The colon colon operator is applicable to a list. In this particular case, we will return the list zero, one, two, three, four, five. Let's call this an added list, or let's say an extended list. We can prepend and append elements with some very special operators. Let's say zero plus column a list, column plus let's say the number six, plus column prepends an element to a list, column plus appends an element to a list. And so the result will be the list zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's with lists. Let me show you sequences. Sequences are denoted by the type seek. So S E Q. Let's call this a sequence as seek of int. So S E Q and S E Q has a constructor seek. Let's call this one, two, three. And the seek is actually as you probably know from object orientation, seek.apply. So seek has a companion object which has an apply method that takes these arguments and it will return an instance deriving from the seek trait. So seek is actually a trait, it's an abstract type, and this apply factory method will actually return an instance of a derived type from sequence. The main characteristic of a sequence is that you can access an element at a given index. So let's call this accessed element as a sequence 
dot apply and you can pass in an index let's say the index one now you know the apply method is allowing an object to be invoked like a function so we can remove that altogether and that will be the same thing so applying a sequence to an index will return the number at that index so the element at index one which in our case that's two all right so that was sequences a particular type of sequence which is very fast for large data is vectors so val a vector is vector let's say one two three four five and so on and so forth vector has very fast access time and has the exact same methods as lists or sequences so i'm going to call this fast sequence implementation all right so that was list sequences vectors let me show you sets so sets are collections with no duplicates so if i define a set as set set applied to the numbers one two three four one two three because i've added the numbers one two three twice they will appear only once in the resulting set so this will be the set one two three four now the main property of a set and the fundamental method of a set is to test whether an element is contained in the set so let's say val set has five as a set dot contains the number five and this will be false because the number five is not contained in the set so the contains method is actually a method that returns true or false whether the argument is actually contained in the set or not you can actually add more elements to the set by calling the plus or remove the elements with the minus method so let's say an added set as a set plus five you know by now that plus is actually a method name from the int type and uh, the plus method is also available on the set type which returns the set one two three four five not necessarily in this order because the order is not important in a set collection let's call this a removed set as a set minus the number let's say three so with the minus sign, you can remove an element out of the collection. So you can say set one, two, and four. The number three is removed. So that was sets. Another very useful collection that we work with in day to day is ranges. This is useful for quote unquote iteration, although obviously we use map and flat map to work on the ranges. So let me define a range as one to 1000. 1 to 1000 is a fictitious collection that does not contain all the numbers between 1 and 1000 but it can be processed as if it did so if i want all the numbers between 2 and 2000 in 2 by 2 increments i can say let's call this 2 by 2 as a range dot map and i can pass in a function an anonymous function x arrow 2 times x or if you're really fancy you can say two times underscore and then you can call to list and this will be the list of all the elements between two and two thousand that are even so we can obtain the list two four six eight and so on and so forth up to two thousand now notice i use the to list method you can use to list to set to sequence to convert in between all these collections in particular to list is very useful it can be called on any other collection and convert that to a list also very useful are tuples which are essentially groups of values under the same value you python users will probably appreciate this so let's call a tuple as the tuple let's say bon jovi the string rock or classical rock and 1982 or something like that so these bits of information are grouped under the single value a tuple and the tuple is delimited by the simple parentheses and finally maps you've surely seen maps before there are associations between some keys and some values so i'm going to define a map as a map let's say between string and int let's say i want to define a phone book Let's say I have a one phone book. 
This will be constructed as a map. So notice I'm calling the apply method on the companion object of map and we can pass in any kind of two argument tuples. So I can say Daniel has the phone number whatever and Jane has the phone number whatever else. Finally, tuples can also be expressed in terms of Jane thin arrow this number, which is equivalent to the regular tuple Jane and that same number. So 327 285. All right, we're done. All right, so in this video, you've learned about Scala as a functional programming language. I hope this video was useful and I'll be waiting for you in the next one. If you liked this video and found it useful, go ahead and click the like button and subscribe to the Rock the JVM channel and I'll be posting more free goodies here. This video series is also available as a free online course at rockthegvm.com where you will also have the option to download these videos for your offline use. And on the Rock the JVM site, we also have hundreds of hours of premium content content dedicated to Scala, functional programming, Aka, Apache Spark, and so much more. So go ahead and check out rockthejvm.com and I'll be waiting for you in the next video.